Hi there. It's good to see you. Thank you for joining me tonight on this Bible study opportunity. And uh, hopefully on your end you're seeing some uh, live video. And uh, I'm going to take just a moment on my end to make sure everything's going okay. And then I'll go ahead and get started. So I've got uh, the GoToMeeting app going. So if you're on the phone with me, you're listening in, thank you very much for joining. And if you are uh, on the YouTubes, then uh, hopefully we'll have some people join us as the minutes go by and people are clicking refresh and the live feed's getting started. But I'm thankful for you being with me and I'm grateful to study with you from the book of James. I hope that these midweek study opportunities, uh, for what they are, are helpful for you. And it's been my purpose in doing these to provide some overview meat. Overview in that we're not getting to jump into every single verse. We're kind of looking at the big picture of these chapters. But also some meat in that we're kind of taking something systematically and we're looking at it uh, part by part. And that by the end of it, there's some meat for you to chew on. That's what I hope we can take away from these studies. So we've studied the book of Titus and uh, over the past three weeks, and now that study's done, and I'm probably going to be making that a public Facebook or rather public YouTube video series soon so that other people can enjoy it. I've had some who have asked me about it, and uh, so then this one as well, I, I keep it unlisted, and I'll continue to keep it unlisted for the next few weeks while we study together, and then after our study's done, I'll uh, then make them public videos. So what I would ask for you to do is uh, please consider this a uh, public study and if you have any questions for me please reach out in a private message that's going to be the way I interact with you in a lot in this live study I won't use the comment section uh, of YouTube I will simply uh, present the material and then I'll be done and then if you have any questions or any comments you can follow up with me afterwards so uh, reaching out privately is the, the way to go so uh, I had a handout for you, and if you were able to print it off, I think it will be something you can use if you want to. It's simply the scriptures, and then it's a series of a bunch of questions. I'm going to try to hold on to my copy, and I'm going to try to ask those questions. But I can tell you right now, I'm probably not going to get to every single one because of time and because I, like I typically do, put way more questions in there than probably I should have. But I hope that that is helpful for you who like to take notes. And I hope that this visual aid of the whiteboard is going to be helpful for you as well as we study through the book of James. Now, if you're taking notes, uh, the series is called James Genuine Faith. I believe that that's kind of the, the major theme throughout this five-chapter book is the genuineness of faith and finding faith in a lot of different facets of our life. Chapter 1, the lesson that we're going to talk about today is faith under fire, and we'll see that primarily in this section, the testings, the trials, the temptations, and how we respond to those is a way that we can have genuine faith. Will you write these questions down, please, if you're taking notes? These are the three main questions. What's our source of joy? What is the source of temptation? And what is the perfect law of liberty? Now, some of you I know are pre-writers, and so you're still learning how to write, and maybe you don't uh, need to worry about writing everything down tonight because it is possible that you uh, can't keep up with what I'm doing. So just do your best. Please don't feel stressed out if you don't get to write as much as I do. Uh, but I want you to just do your best. Think about those questions and here's the main idea. I can use trials to become complete. And what does that mean to become complete? Well, we're going to talk about that tonight, about becoming a complete person in faith. Uh, something that, uh, another word that we use is perfect, that we're reaching for perfection. And anyway, so I hope that we'll uh, consider these things together. Now, I want to go through the intro as quickly as I can. Uh, the, the sad part about that is that it really does deserve its own study, because just looking at James, the big picture, really helps you appreciate what's going on in chapter by chapter. But what I thought I'd do is take you through uh, the, the five places in Scripture and then the sixth place that's outside of the canon of Scripture that talk about James, or at least five of them. There are more than five. But the first one that we see is in John chapter 7, verse 3 through 5. James did not believe in Jesus initially. That's important to know, is that while others were believing in Jesus, James and his family members 
uh, they came to try to take Jesus and take him home because they thought he was crazy. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, it says that Jesus appeared to James. And so, at this point, uh, James becomes a believer if he wasn't already one beforehand. And we know that Jesus appeared to him after his resurrection. So, that's something special that he had. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5 says that he was married. And so, many scholars suggest that he was an elder and that in the Jerusalem Council, he's one of the elders that's represented there. He's a, a great leader of faith. In fact, I am kind of speaking ahead of myself about Acts 15, but let's uh, make this point real quick. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, he is in the upper room with the disciples when the Holy Spirit comes down on them, and so he is there to uh, witness and see the power of the Holy Spirit as promised whenever it gives them the miraculous ability to speak in foreign languages. In Acts 15, um, he is a leader of great respect, and his words are what cause the Jerusalem uh, people, the council, some people might call it, but really it's just the, the leaders of that place and the church and their leadership, they take his advice and uh, they start to spread this information up to the Gentiles. They do not have to be circumcised. And so that, there's a big uh, part that he plays in the early days of the church. And now, finally, Josephus tells us, and Josephus is just a writer, a historian who is Jewish from that time, and a lot of the things he said people use as evidence to support what happened historically. Josephus says that James was killed in A.D. 62 by the Jews that they took him and threw him off the wall uh, at the temple. And whenever he survived that, then they uh, tried to stone him to death. And when he survived that, uh, they uh, I believe they killed him with the sword, is what Josephus said. And so he was, a, a if this is to be true, an incredibly tough physical person. Now here's some fun facts about James that I want you to write down as well. Uh, and the, the epistle itself was written somewhere between A.D. 40 and 60. And it's the early days of the church, right? Something interesting in James's epistle is that he really doesn't address the transition of Jews to Jews and Gentiles at all. He's always talking about his brethren. He calls them the 12 tribes that are dispersed. And so most scholars think that he was writing in a time when the church was still primarily made up of Jewish people. The audience that he has, uh, is writing to, is alienated. So you could write that. The audience is alienated and lonely. They're already separated from their countrymen around in the different areas of the world they're in because they're not pagans. And so they, they were already isolated from them. But now they're being isolated from their Jewish uh, countrymen, from their Jewish family members. When they turn their back on Judaism, they turn their back on their community. So these people are lonely, they're alienated, and they're wondering, what is, uh, what are we supposed to do? How is faith going to get us through this? Here's something else. 54 out of the 108 verses are imperative. That means a command. And so think about that. Literally 50% of the verses that are written in this little book are commands. James is constantly telling Christians what they need to be doing to improve. Now because James doesn't mention the resurrection in this letter, he doesn't mention the resurrection and he doesn't mention his own authority. Rather he calls himself a bond servant of Jesus. There have been many that were skeptical about whether this letter should be even in the canon of Scripture. And when I say canon I don't mean the machine that fires the uh, the cannonball. The canon of Scripture just means the body of Scripture. So the 66 books that make up the Bible, some people think that James shouldn't have been in it. One of them uh, was Martin Luther, and, and some of those that were associated with him and the Reformation movement, because James didn't talk about the resurrection, didn't talk about the gospel, about grace, etc., that they thought, well, certainly he's at odds with Paul. And Paul, which he loved, Martin Luther loved, and made up his series of doctrines in the Reformation, he really wanted James to be secondary. And there's a lot of cool information about that. 
However, most scholars and those who were around at the time when the scriptures were compiled eventually did come to understand, appreciate, and realize what is true, and that is that James was inspired and that he does get along with Paul, and his works are complementary. They're not contradictory. So what I want us to do is focus on three great sections. Proper attitudes during the times of testing, the source of temptation as compared to what people think the source of temptation might be, and finally, the products of genuine faith. And I wish I could read it all, but I'll just read a little bit from each section. And uh, if the, on the handout that you have, this is from the New King James Version, and it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, the first question that I want to ask you is, what does the word or what is the joy, rather, that we have whenever we go through various trials? What's that source? And then what exactly is a trial? Now, when you study the book of James, you'll see that there are, depending on the translation, trials, tests, temptations. And in English, we might think they're three different words, but in Greek, it was all the same word. And really, what they had to do was look at the context. And so, yes, the trial the temptation, the testing. It may have been the same word in Greek, but in Greek they would know that it was talking about different things based on the context. And so the context would tell them one of two things. The context would say either this trial is amoral or the trial is moral in its nature. And that just means something that it is, it does have some sort of implication with God's law. And then amoral means it, it may not have an implication with God's law. You know, the trial might be that uh, if you're at work and your boss tells you to lie, that's a moral trial. You're being tested, and there's moral consequences if you choose to go along with that lie. However, an amoral trial uh, might be, let's, let's keep using the, the example of a job. Let's say in your job you're overrun by cockroaches. There's nothing moral about that, although I know many of us might think that that's, uh, you know, Satan's beast. However, if your job is overrun by cockroaches, you're going through a time of testing. You know, you may feel really gross, and it may be really icky, and you've got to get them all out of there, and you're being tested, but it's amoral. Now, obviously, there could be some moral consequences if we are not using uh, ourselves wisely, the words we say, etc. But we can observe there's two different types of trials, the moral and amoral. And this joy that we have, what, what is the source of it? Are, are, we, are we happy to suffer? Are we enjoying the pain? Obviously, that's not what James is talking about here. What we find joy in is opportunity. And uh, one of our kids' favorite books, it's one of my favorite series of books growing up, is Calvin and Hobbes. It's a series of little comic strips of the boy and his pet tiger. And recently I've come to realize that I've turned into the dad in that comic strip because Calvin's dad says all the time, it builds character. What does it mean to build character? It means you're having the opportunity, based on the testings and the trials that you go through, to improve yourself and become a better person. And so Titus, or sorry, I got Titus on the brain from last week's series. James talks about these three parts in a chain or in a line of progression that helps us improve as a, a woman or a man of faith. The first thing he says is that whenever you're tested, whenever there is this testing, he says, verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith, what does it produce? Look at the next verse. What does it produce? It produces patience. And when patience has its fulfillment, what does it produce? It produces a perfect man or a complete man. And so the question is, when you go through testing and you're building your patience, it's going to allow you to become perfect, but what kind of perfection are you becoming? Are you becoming flawless? Or are you becoming mature? That's very important to know the difference, is that we're not becoming flawless, because other scriptures tell us that we know that we're going to have problems with sin. And 1 John chapter 1 and 2, especially great scriptures that talk about if anyone does sin, then they can confess that, that they can uh, be, be uh, faithful, and then they can continue to walk in the light as he's the light. And so we know that this perfection that it's talking about here is a maturity type of perfection, one where we are complete 
because of testing that produces patience. So that makes me think about this question. And here we've got the thinker sitting there, and he's asking, how does a trial produce wisdom? And how does God give wisdom? And I ask that because it's talking about patience. It says in verse 4, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And so there's this uh, kind of a move, a transition from patience to wisdom. And so the question I have is, how does this testing, how does it produce wisdom? I guess specifically in this chain, how does testing produce patience? And how does God give me patience? Well, think about this. When you pray to God for patience, what does he typically do? Does he suddenly give you the ability to be patient, like he opens up your brain and pours in patience and suddenly you're able to get through it? I don't know about you, but I, when I, at least the providence that I see in my life, when I ask for patience, God sends me something to teach me patience. And I go through a trial that, that uh, it asks me or causes me to grow instead of uh, me getting to just kind of stay and plateau at the level that I'm at. And so taking patience as an example, it moves over to wisdom. How does God give wisdom? Well, he gives it when you ask for it. And then when you ask for wisdom, he puts things in your life, he puts things in your life to teach you wisdom. Now, what happens next in this little series is a comparison a comparison of those who have genuine faith versus those who have dead faith. So write that down. Write this T-chart down. And specifically in chapter 1, people who have de uh, dead faith are called double-minded. And we'll reapproach the concept of dead faith in chapter 2 next week whenever we study together. But genuine faith versus dead faith is what's on display. And the next series of verses, I won't read them, but I'm going to uh, quickly write these down and I'll ask you to do the same. Somebody who has genuine faith asks God, whether it's for wisdom or whatever discipline you may be searching for, you're willing to ask God. Dead faith does not ask. Either they think they can handle it on their own or they think God's not going to give it to them. People who have genuine faith don't doubt. But people who have dead faith are doubters. Now I want to pause there just to make this point. Have you ever doubted? Does that mean you're a doubter? And I believe the answer is no. We have other scriptures. I think about in Jude 1, verse 23, I believe, where it says, Have mercy on those who doubt. There's a big difference between those who doubt and are sincere and genuine in what they're doing, and they're asking people for help. They're asking God for help. God, I don't understand. Help me get through this. And those who are doubters, that they pray to God, but they're double-minded. And in this scripture, it talks about these folks on one hand, they're praying. On the other hand, they don't believe he's going to answer it. And so if you're being two-faced or double-minded, if you're being a hypocrite, that's being a doubter. But having doubts is not wrong as long as we're asking God and we're searching for truth and we're involving ourselves with others, we're confessing our sins. You just have to have genuine faith. Uh, the final things are if the poor go through a trial, they are to boast and when the rich go through a trial, they are to be humble. However, if you have dead faith, it's the poor who typically are humbled, and it's the rich who are boastful. And I'll leave you to read those more on your own. But verse 12 is the key of the passage. Oh, verse 12 is so important. Please write that down or mark it or do something, because verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Think about it. The man who is uh, able to have patience and get through, you have two rewards. You have a heavenly reward. It talks about in verse 12 of eternal life. But you also have a reward right now. You're able to be mature. And all of us, I don't care how old you are, you don't like to be called immature. Oh, you're just a big baby, aren't you? When you're called that, you think, hey, I'm not a baby. Now, my six-year-old, she's a big girl. When we call her a baby, or if she acts like one, immediately she changes because she doesn't want to be called a baby anymore. She wants to be mature or complete. And so we can count it all joy when we go through both amoral and moral trials because the testing of that produces patience. And in this life, we can have maturity so that the next time we go through a trial, 
we're able to go through it a little bit more graciously. I don't know about you, but I feel like I've gone through a trial over the past month and a half. I'm not sure if I'm even out of it yet. But the fire that came because of this amoral trial of the corona crisis has also caused some moral trials in my life. Some of them I've passed, others I've not passed as well as I would have liked to. And because of that, it gives me opportunity to grow. That's the joy, opportunity to grow. And if there's anything that you should get out of this during the corona crisis is that you have had an abundance of opportunity to grow. Well, let's move into the next section. It's verses 13 through 18. It's the source of our temptations. When you think about this testing that we're going through, we understand that it could be moral or amoral, but sometimes people say, you know what? God is tempting me. And we see this little angel on one side and a demon on the other. And, you know, uh, we, we think of them as these spiritual beings who are trying to tempt us. And somebody will associate that spiritual temptation with God himself, that God is the one that in these tests that he's sending me, he's actually trying to tempt me to do wrong. And what you and I need to say to that person is no way. There's no way that God is tempting you. Could God be testing you amorally so that you can develop patience? Yes. Could God be testing you so that you have a moral response? Yes, but God is not going to send you temptations that cause you to sin. The Bible, in fact, in this passage, gives us uh, this source of temptation. In fact, there's three, but so we could uh, talk about the true source of temptation. I'm running out of space, so I'm going to write the true source of tempt. How do I know what the true source of temptation is according to James chapter 1? Well, I have to read it. Verse 13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. Number one, God, according to verse 13, God cannot be tempted. Okay, so that's the first thing I can note. God cannot be tempted. Secondly, uh, God does not tempt anyone. And third, it talks about how uh, when each one is tempted. And we're going to kind of illustrate that for you right here on this temptation. It says, when each of you is tempted, the first thing that happens is desire. And you might write down, uh, let's see, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is where they begin. They begin with the lusts of what we desire, whether it be pride, you know, the lifting up of self, or whether it be lust for flesh, the lust of the eyes. It always begins with the thought. You know, it's like a choice. The choice is given to you on this silver platter. Do you want to pursue this? where it may feel good for as a lust or may feel good for your stroking your ego. Do you want to pursue this? And if you choose to pursue it, it says that it gives birth to sin. And sin, if you write down 1 John chapter 3, uh, let's see, verse 4, it says that sin is transgression of God's law. And that's the point where you have a spiritual problem, where you're separated from God. I want to pause here just to say that to be tempted is not the same as to sin. And if you're ever tempted, you shouldn't feel guilty about being tempted. It's when we sin that we have a problem with God. Jesus was tempted in every way that we are except without sin. And because Jesus was tempted, he knows what we're going through. He's a high priest who's able to uh, sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted, and you are tempted. And, and so don't feel guilty for being tempted. Feel guilty in the way that you respond to it if you give in to temptation. And temptation leads to sin, and when sin is full grown, it leads to death. And uh, we could write down Romans chapter uh, let's see, 6, verse 23, where it talks about how the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so those who say that God is tempting me, they forget that when really what causes temptation is your own desires, which leads to sin, which leads to death. 
And if anybody out there wants more information, I just did a study earlier today on out of context, I was born in sin from Psalm 51 verse 5. And I, it, uh, maybe I'd encourage you to go check that out. You can see it on YouTube or Facebook under the series Out of Context. Now, there's a little bit more to this passage. God doesn't give us sin and death. That's our own desire. But what does God give us? Right? So I'm going to ask that down here real quick in a little question cloud. What does God give us? Oh, I'm messing it up. What does God give if he doesn't tempt us? Well, what does he give us? Well, it says he gives us every good and perfect gift. God wants you to be saved. He doesn't want you to be lost. And so God is giving you every good and perfect gift. He sent Jesus Christ to die for your sins. So God, when he puts you in a trial, is not wanting you to fail morally. Now, you may fail amorally through trials, and you know that's going to cause you to learn to grow the same way that getting a scab or a cut causes your body to heal and be a little bit stronger, right? Uh, God wants to test you so that you will grow in your moral response so that you will be a complete person. But the temptation element of when trials happen, various trials in this life, that is on you whenever you uh, follow that desire. Now, God also gives something else. It says in verse 18, of his own will, he has brought us forth by. So what does God give? God gives the word of truth. And we're going to come back to that in just a moment. But I want you to write that down. God gives the word of truth. And think about that as we move into our final section very quickly on the products of genuine faith. Now, when I think about genuine faith, I need to go ahead and write this down. Uh, we're looking at a section where faith is under fire. And that's the title of our lesson today is faith under fire. And so during the trial, uh, you should be responding to trials a certain way. And here are some examples that James gives of the way that you should respond to them. He gives some imperatives, some commands. He says, be. And then he also says, lay aside. And then he says, receive. And then finally, he says, be again. And what I'd like to do is take you through these four commands very quickly of the things that he asks for us to be when faith is under fire. So when you're going through this trial, this is an excellent set of, uh, I guess, weapons to have at your disposal to help you overcome the enemy and overcome the part of yourself that's doubting. First, he says, be three things. You should be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, or slow to anger. Because then he goes on to say that anger does not produce righteousness. And I like the word produce because it has the idea of a plant, right? If you're going to sow something, it should produce the thing in its kind. So if you're sowing anger, you're not going to harvest righteousness. You should be sowing peace. You should be sowing this ability to hear and listen. Oh, how I wish we could go into this a lot farther. But just look at that list of things that you should be doing when you're under fire, when you're stressed out, when you've been tested. You need to take a step back and take a deep breath. There's a reason people say count to three, right? Or count to five or whatever. Take that deep breath and listen. And don't be the one to explode with anger because anger does not produce righteousness. Now we'll come back to that in a moment. But he tells us to lay aside a couple of things. He says, first, lay aside filthiness and the overflow of wickedness. And certainly this is not the only thing that we're supposed to lay aside, but James is giving a great example of how when we become a Christian, that we are not actively pursuing a life of sin. And so this filthiness, this wickedness that's associated with the world, we abandon it, especially when faith is under fire. Get rid of anything that is keeping you from the Lord. 
and draw near to him instead of trying to do it on your own. Okay, very quickly, uh, we're supposed to receive something. And it says we receive the word implanted. And I want to do an illustration here that will hopefully be helpful for you. And just a reminder for those of you on uh, GoToMeeting, please make sure your phone is muted. The word implanted carries that same picture concept of not producing righteousness. And so the word implanted is the idea of something organic is happening in you. Just like you reap what you sow, when the word is implanted in your heart, what should it be doing? It should be producing fruit. When the word is implanted, it's like it's being seeded into your heart, and then it produces a fruit. I'm going to say it one more time. Those who are on GoToMeeting, please make sure that you are muted. And uh, so the word implanted, what I want to connect it to real quick, is the word of truth. We have three ways in James chapter 1 where it talks about the Bible. It, talks, it calls it the word of truth. It calls it the word implanted. And it talks about one more thing uh, that we'll mention here in just a second. But I want to say this about the word implanted. The word implanted is able to save what the book of James says. Verse 21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And we could write down other scriptures that talk about that. You could write down Romans chapter 6 verse 17 where it talks about how you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. So the word has a saving quality. Of course we're saved by grace through faith. But how in the world do you ever hear about God to know what grace is, to know what faith is? And the answer is through the Word. We have to read. We have to be a people who are familiar with the book. Many of us are going through the New Testament right now, and we're wrapping up uh, the New Testament. I'm having a little bit of problems with the go-to meeting, so I'm just going to say if you're on go-to meeting, please go ahead and, and jump over to YouTube for me. I'm going to go ahead and end it. Um, for those, sorry, who are on YouTube for the distraction, um, several of us are going through the New Testament right now. We're just about to wrap it up. We've been reading it four months together. What a treat it has been. And in the next five days or so, we're going to be finished. But don't let that be the end of your Bible reading for 2020. Let it be the beginning. Let, it, let there be a, a reawakening, a time of refreshing where you're going through the Word daily, consistently, in the New Testament and in the Old. Okay. Uh, very quickly, this final command, which deserves a whole sermon on its own, we're supposed to be doers of the word and not hearers only. James draws a very, very clear distinction between those who hear and those who do. And he actually uh, is reminiscent to what Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 7. And all the times in Matthew chapter 7 where uh, Jesus talked about those who said, Lord, would not inherit the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. What's so frustrating is that people who look at James and say, oh, that doesn't sound anything like Paul. He sounds a lot like Jesus, though. And he says that people who are hearers only are like somebody who goes and looks in the mirror, and they see themselves, but then they go away, and they immediately forget what they look like whenever they turn around and walk away. They can't see this reflection. They're not introspective. They're not looking to improve. That's what happens when you only hear. But a hearer and a doer, a doer is constantly being swift to hear. They're constantly laying aside the things that are holding them back. They're constantly receiving the word implanted. That's what a doer is doing. And it says that the doer of the word, verse 25, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty perfect law of liberty. And this is the second to final point that I want to make, but we're going to take that illustration of the plant and we're going to bring it over here into this one. This is the third time that James is talking about the Word of God. He calls it a gift. This Word of Truth, this, this part of the good gifts that God gives, it's the Word of Truth. 
It's the word implanted that's able to save. It's the law of liberty. Wow. Isn't that amazing to see how James viewed Scripture? And it's the way that you should view Scripture, too. The Scriptures are so important. I hope that you're reading them, and I hope that you're spending time with it, not just superficially to check something off, but to grow in what the Bible teaches. What is it talking about when it says perfect law of liberty? I'm going to just mention these Scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter. 13, verse 13, he says, But when the perfection comes, then that which is partial will be done away with. And so the age of the miraculous gifts that they had in the first century to help the church grow, this perfect law of liberty, that perfection, when it came, then those gifts would go away. So write that down. The, the concept of law. You know, people say that we're not under law, but we're under grace, because there is a scripture that mentions that. But what law is that talking about? It's talking about the law of Moses. You really should uh, watch my context series if you haven't looked at it already. But in the context, we use context clues to determine what a scripture is saying. And in James and other places in the New Testament, uh, let's see, in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, it calls it the law of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter, uh, let's see, 6, verse 2, it talks about the law of Christ. There is law in the New Testament. It's the law of Jesus. That's what covenant is. We have this covenant law. There's this promise that Jesus died for, this agreement, this testament. And the terms of the covenant is the New Testament. It's, it's what we live by to keep up our end of it. Yes, we're saved by God's grace. There's nothing we could have done to deserve it. But we're saved by God's grace through faith. And faith is what someone who is a hearer and a doer is doing. We are obeying the law, and it's the perfect law of liberty. And I want you to write down where uh, Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 32, those who the Son sets free are free indeed. And uh, Paul in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, mentions how the freedom that we have, is, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. But don't use your freedom or your liberty as by means of an excuse to go live a life of sin, but rather you're supposed to be the liberty that you're set free in through Jesus should be one that's causing you to be righteous and to pursue righteousness. Well, the last thing from this, and then we'll be done, is the last couple of verses here. It says in verse 26, if anyone among you thinks he's religious, so have faith under fire, it refines a religious person. Faith under fire refines a religious person. The first thing that it does is it identifies two things that will make a man's religion useless. What are the two things that makes my religion useless? Well, according to the scripture, it says, if any man thinks he's religious, but does not bridle his tongue, and deceives his own heart. So, does not bridle his tongue, deceives his own heart. Then his religion is useless. Now, you may have somebody who says it's not about religion, it's about a relationship. That person doesn't understand what the word religion means. Religion simply means the outward expression of worship. That's what the, the Bible says and uh, the dictionaries and the Greek lexicons, etc. It's the outer expression of worship. That's what religion is. And so the person who is not living right is, has vain religion, has false religion. They're not bridling their tongue. They're, they're quick to speak. They're quick to anger instead of being righteous in their religion and being swift to hear. Well, what do you do to have good religion? What do you do to have a good outward expression of the worship that you're supposed to be giving to God? Well, verse 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion is this, to visit widows and orphans in their distress. So I'm going to put visit W plus O, widows and orphans. Will you write that down? Visit widows and orphans in their distress and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. What does that mean? Is that the only two things you have to do to have pure religion? Do you have to just visit widows and orphans and keep yourself unspotted? Those two specific literal things, these are examples. They're meant to express 
uh, the part of a greater concept. And that greater concept, let me flip over to a different color. That greater concept is that as a pure person, as part of a pure religion, I want to help others. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to help others? Because that's what Jesus called us to do, is to help others. And also to possess a sense of self-control. You have to control self. There has to be growth. There has to be growth. There has to be growth. You cannot coast as a Christian. You cannot coast as when the word is implanted. Think about it. Plants don't just stay. You put them in the ground, they either grow or they die. They don't just stay. I know you could talk, especially you know my wife and others who are really into plants, you could talk to me about the dormancy of plants, etc. But here, just bear with me in the simple analogy. You either die or you grow. And that's what I want to leave you with here, is this faith under fire. It refines us. Trials, testing, it refines us. It causes us to be patient. It causes, patient. It causes us to have wisdom so that we can have maturity. That way, when the next trial comes, we're able to have uh, grace and bear it with a little bit more grace than maybe we did the last time. And that's the end of James chapter 1 study for tonight. I hope it was helpful for you. And uh, sorry about some of the technical difficulties I had for people who are on the go-to meeting. Um, but I hope that the YouTube study went well and that uh, you will benefit from it. So at this point, I would hope that maybe there are those who either already have or are planning on uh, singing some songs with their family. If you uh, would like to, there's the Denton County Songbook that uh, we've sent out by email. I've sent that out a few times, the digital PDF, you could have that. Or if you've got a copy of them, uh, family Bible time or family worship, whatever you want to call it, that time building at the family altar is really healthy and important. So I want to encourage families to do that. I also want to encourage you to pray. I know you do. And uh, pray for me. Pray for the decisions I have to make with my ministry. Pray for those in our congregation who have asked for prayers specifically. You know who I'm talking about. And then there's obviously people all over the world that maybe you know that I don't. And so you need to pray for them, and I'll pray for the ones I know, and we'll just keep lifting up these people to the Father. So James 1, faith under fire. When faith is under fire, that is an excellent way to prove the genuineness and to grow in the genuineness of your faith. Have a wonderful evening. God bless you, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.